but let me read to you the gospel. Uh, the gospel is, is from Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus teaches us. It's, it's a parable commonly called the parable of the talents. And what, what I'll invite you to do as you listen to it, you'll hear this as we get into the sermon. What I'll invite you to do is, is, is ask yourself the question, what does this parable do to me as I listen to it? This is the, the gospel from Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. Jesus says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags also of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered, scattered seeds. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and scatter where I have not scattered, gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then. You should have put my money in deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the comfort that your word gives to us. We pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, we pray that it would be pleasing in your sight, that it would prepare us Uh, to greet you and to meet you when you come again to take us into our home in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I asked you this question when I started to read it a second ago, but this parable of the talents, what does it do to you? When, when you hear this, when you think about it, when you meditate on the truth of this parable, what does it do to you? How does it strike you? How does it, how does it make you feel? Uh, parables are actually supposed to do something to us. You know, it, it's one thing to stand up front and like Jesus often so does in his ministry, to, he just teaches. You know, it, it's one thing to just lay it out there and say, this is how it is, this is the way it is, this is what I want you to do, this is where you need to repent, this is what I want you to believe. It's one thing just to say it. It's another thing to tell a story to drive home a truth. Parables are, are, are a teaching method, a tool that Jesus uses to drive something home. And parables are supposed to do something to us. Remember that parable that Nathan told David. The, the parable about the, the man who had a little sheep who was really special to him and the neighbor came and took it and killed it and, and, and didn't pay him back. Remember how that parable helped David finally get it? Oh yeah, I'm the man. I'm the one who stole the little sheep. I'm the one who sinned in such a grievous way. David wasn't hearing the message any other way, so God sent Nathan to tell him a parable to drive home a truth. 
Or, or think about the parables that Jesus told to the Pharisees who absolutely were pushing against Jesus throughout his ministry, but then he told them a parable, a parable about a vineyard and, and rent that was owed and how the, the, the king kept sending servants and finally his own son and, the, and, the, and, and how the vineyard workers, they beat and killed the son and they finally realized, oh, you're talking about us, aren't you? And it was after that that they wanted to kill Jesus. See, see, parables, when you hear them, they're supposed to do something to you. So this parable of the talents, what does it do to you? Does it make you scared? The parable, I'll tell it to you again. It's really quite simple. It's really quite straightforward. There's a master. And this master is going, Jesus tells us this master is going away on a journey. It's a, this is a parable of two parts. So the master comes and he, and he calls his servants and there's only three that we hear about. Perhaps there are more, but there's only three that are important to the story. To the first servant, the master calls him in and he says, here's five talents. And immediately that, that servant takes the five talents. He, he invests them, he puts them to work, he, and he makes five more. He calls in another servant and he gives the servant, this servant two Two talents. A talent, by the way, is a unit of money. In, as you read it before, you probably heard me read bags of gold. That, that's more equivalent, but maybe less accurate. Because talent, you think talent, you think about skills. When the Bible talks about talents, it's talking about money. So he called in the second servant and gave him his two talents. And immediately, that servant too, he took the two talents and he put them to work. And he invested them and made more. He doubled, he doubled what he had been given. And the master called in a third servant, this third servant, he only gave one talent. I think it's important to know, we'll get to this later on more in detail, but it's important to notice that the master gave to each one according to his ability. So he gave to this final servant just a single talent. Maybe that was, that was all the master knew that this servant could do and handle. He didn't want to give him too much. But that servant, he took that talent and rather than put it to work, at least with the bankers, later the master would say, he just dug a hole and put it in the hole and waited for his master to return. So the master went away. He went away on a journey. He was away for a long time and the servants did their work. That's part one. In part two of the story, now the master comes home and it's time to settle. It's, it's time to reconcile the books. And he calls his servants in and he asks for an accounting of their work. And the first servant comes in and he, he, he had taken his five talents and he had made five more talents, so he had a total of ten. And he comes in, you can almost, can you sense this in the words? If you look back and you almost sense it in the words that he's coming in like a preschooler with a, with a coloring page, like, look! Right? He, he comes in, the master calls him in and he's not worried, he's not scared. He says, Master, I, I have these five and I got five more. Look what I did. And, and the master, it's all sharing and joy and happiness. Come, well done, good servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Second servant is really the same thing. If you look at the words, they're exactly the same. Second servant comes in with two, his two talents plus two more talents. He doubled what he had been given. And he comes in and he, and he shares it with the master. Look what I did. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. And the third servant, he, when the master came back, he had to do some work. He had to go dig it up and he'd find the hole and get his hands dirty. And then he came in. You can almost hear this in his, in his words too. He, he come, comes in with a scowl and a grumble. And you can almost hear him take that that talent, that bag of gold, and here, take what's yours, you hard man. And it's all suffering and loss and deprivation, and the master chucks, chucks him outside like, like, a, like garbage, throws him outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, I'll ask you the question, this parable of the talents, what does it do to you? Does it make you scared? Maybe it should. See, this parable forces us to ask ourselves a question. As we live in preparation for Jesus to return, are we putting the talents, and I'm, I'm talking money, but I'm also talking time, I'm also talking our, our abilities, are we putting what God has given us to work? When, we, when it comes time for us to stand before the Master and give an accounting of our labor while we worked here on earth, have we done all that we can with what he's given us as we wait for him to come home? As we come for him, as we wait for him to come and take us home. 
Have we done all that we can with our money? Have we invested it? I'm not talking about the banks, although that could be part of it. Have we invested it in his kingdom? Have we used our abilities and our time? Have we, used, have we given of ourselves to, to each other here at church, to our community at large, to our families? Have we poured ourselves out for them because they're gifts from God? This, this parable forces us to ask the hard question, have I done all that I can with what God has given me as I wait for him to return? Have I remembered that what he's given me is just a trust? A trust from him to be used for him and for his glory as I wait for him to come back. The truth is, if you ask yourself that question long enough and hard enough and you keep digging down and you look at every corner and every part of your life, you'll answer that question, does it scare you? And you'll probably say, <laughs> yeah. Because when you ask yourself that question, what kind of savior, what kind of master, what kind of God do you picture coming back for you? I, I don't know about you, but, but I, we live in a world that often thinks Jesus is disappointed with us. Do you feel that sometimes? Where, where you look at, at the life that you live, the things that God's given you in your life, the, the responsibilities, the callings, the, the, in, the things that God has entrusted you do. Sometimes look at, get to the end of a day or the end of a week or we're getting to the end of a year and you, and you look back at your life and you, and you think Jesus must just be sitting in heaven saying, you guys, you could have done so much more. You could have at least put it at the bank, right? You could have done so much more. Do you, do you sometimes look at your life and imagine Jesus getting to the table, the judge's table at the end of your life when Jesus returns and Jesus looks at the ledger and he looks what you gave back and he just kind of says, you know, I gave you so much. You didn't always use it for me. You sometimes used it for yourself. You sometimes did absolutely nothing with what I gave you. And he just kind of shakes his head in disgust and disappointment. Do you, do you sometimes live your life and feel this great, this weight of disappointment from your Savior Jesus as he looks at you and says, you feel like Jesus is just kind of sitting in heaven saying, you guys are letting me down. This parable of the talents, what does it do to you? Does it scare you? Does it burden you? Maybe it should. But does it comfort you? Because it really should. You realize, of course, that this parable isn't really, the, the, the second part of this parable is really about the talents and the working with the talents. That's really the second part. You, really, you realize what the most central part of this whole parable is? It's not the servants. It's not the talents. It's the master. The, the master is the very first, of the, in the entire story, the master is the very first character mentioned. The kingdom of heaven is like a master who was going away on a journey. This is a, uh, this is a parable about, about a master who came and entrusted his servants with stuff, with talents. Each according to their own abilities. It's a master who, who trusted his servants so much that he went away on a journey and he didn't micromanage them while they were gone. This is, a, this is about a good master. The first two servants teach us that, in a way, right? You can look at these first two servants. You notice they're, 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 they don't feel burdened, do they, when they go away after they've been trusted with their talents, the five bags, the five talents, and then the two talents? They don't feel burdened or upset. They're like, oh, great, I get to do something. Immediately, the text says, right away, they go and they, they get to work with what they've been given. And then when the master comes back, I, sorry for the analogy, but it's the, it's the best analogy that comes in my mind. There, you know, some of you have dogs. And how do, you, how do your dogs come back to you when they've done something wrong? You can just imagine the picture in your mind, can't you, with their, their head down and they're really crouched down, their tails are between their legs and they're just kind of like this. But, but when your dog, when your dog is really excited to bring you something, how do they come? 
leaping and bounding maybe with a treat in their mouth. And, and sometimes it's not even really a treat. Sometimes our dogs have, have caught little rabbits and they come running to you like, oh, look what I got! And we're like, ugh. Sorry for the analogy, but that's the picture I get of these first two servants. When their master comes back, they're not even thinking about how they let their master down. They're only thinking about, look, master, look what I've got for you. I've got this special thing for you. I've got, I doubled what you gave me. Look, master, look, here it is. It's for you. But you know who I think teaches us the most about the master and teaches us that he's good? I, I think it's the third servant. This may be a weird thing for me to say. But follow me. Whenever you read a story, you always have to decide who in the story is telling you the truth. For instance, as you read the narrative of Matthew, what have you learned about the Pharisees? Whenever the Pharisees talk, almost every time they talk, they're, they're either not telling the truth or they're duplicitous in what they have to say. Right? We immediately have, we've decided about the Pharisees that almost any time they talk, it's a lie or it's sneaky, or snake-like. And, and we even decide that about sometimes about the apostles, too. Right? Peter, sometimes Peter is right on, but then sometimes you read the accounts of Peter, and you're like, oh, Peter, why? why? Peter, you're not telling the truth right now. See, and what happens to you when you read the story about, about the talents, about the three servants, and about the master? What happens when you listen to this third servant talk? You decide immediately that he's not telling the truth about the master. Right? You, you almost say right away, that's not my master. My master's good. Just play along with me a little bit. A little bit do, try, try a little role play. Right? Speaking, to, imagine that you're talking to the third servant. You say that my master is hard. But do you know what I say about my master? I say that my master is easy and his burden is light. You say that my master scatters, he gathers where he has not scatters and he reaps what he has not sown. But I tell you that my, the burden that my master gives me is light and his yoke is easy. You say that my master is one who squeezes blood out of turnips, that he, he will turn a penny into a profit, even if it's not his. You say that my master is ungenerous and unkind. I say that my master is generous beyond belief. And he's free and giving with his gifts. You say that my master is hard. I, I say that my master is good. And he is good, isn't he? Our master, Jesus, is the only master who became a servant. Remember that when he was born? You know that. That's what we're remembering right these days, right? He became a human being. He took on flesh so that he took on the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The master became a servant. And what does our Savior Jesus, our Master Jesus, invite us to do? He doesn't come to lay more burdens on us. He says to us, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am not hard, but gentle and humble in heart. Our master, Jesus, is not, a, is not a hard man who expects more of us than we could ever give to him, who, who keeps track of all the ways that we failed him, who keeps track of all the ways that we failed him. Do you know what he did with all the ways, uh, with all the things that we've done wrong against you? He took them away and nailed them to the cross. He has forgotten our sins and remembers them no more. So that when you come before him on the last day and bring him your gifts and bring him your offerings and bring him your life, he does not remember your sins anymore. Your master Jesus has, has given you gifts. When he ascended into heaven, you know what Paul says? When he ascended into heaven, he gave gifts to his people. Paul says that to the Ephesians in chapter 4. When he ascended into heaven, he gave gifts to people. He's given gifts to you, and it's, it's financial, it's, 
its talents, its skills and abilities, its your time, it's everything about you and about your life. Everything that is in your life, it's given to you as a trust from your Savior who loves you. And, and He invites you, your Savior invites you to do something with it because He loves you. And He receives it from you. You know, you know I'll, I'll use a different, I won't use a dog analogy anymore. I'll use a preschooler analogy. That might be more appropriate for people. But how many parents or preschool teachers or, or any kind of teacher, when, when a kid has said, Look what I did! How many of you preschool teachers have said, you know what, you could have stayed inside the lines at least? You don't, you don't do that, right? When they bring you their best, you, you receive it with thanks. Right? This is our Savior Jesus. He is not a, he's not a hard master, a cruel master, a master who burdens us. He is a good master who remembers our sins and gives us work to do. This parable of the talents, does it comfort you? It should. Does it encourage you? It should do that too. I want to tell you a little bit. I'm going to walk you through the parable, kind of word by word, and I want to show you how good your master has been to you and how he equips you and gifts you to serve him. In the very beginning of the parable, it talks about the master who called his servants in and entrusted gifts, these talents to them. Just think about that word, entrusted. He, he, he said, he could have done it himself, he could have handled it all himself, but instead he said, here, I want you to do it. Do you realize what a huge word that is? That Jesus, Jesus could have sent angels to do his work on earth. He could have. He could have sent angels to carry out the work of the church. He could have sent angels to take care of our lives. But instead, he, he gave that to you and to me. He gave that to us to do. He entrusted us. He entrusted, next word, each one according to their ability. In other words, sometimes we always think, I wish Jesus would give me more, or they wish he'd give me something else. But, but notice the power and the comfort of that simple word, each one according to their ability. Jesus has given you exactly what he wants you to have so that you can do what, what he wants you to do. Right? He hasn't given you too much. He hasn't given you too little. He has given you exactly what he wants you to have so that you can do what he wants you to do. There's one other detail I want to explain about the parable. It's the word talent. I've mentioned it before. It's, it's a unit of money. But does anybody, I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Kai, maybe you know the answer. I don't, how much is a talent financially? Any guesses? Do you have a guess, Kai? 50? 50, 50 what? Fifty dollars, a little bit more than that. Keep no. Uh, people debate like exactly how much it is, but a talent is is really a weight. Of of it's a it's a weight could refer to silver, it could be gold. One scholar estimate this is just one talent is worth today one point four million dollars. Now he gave the first servant five times. Five talents. Second servant, two talents. Third servant, one talent. 1 1.4 times one times two times five. But then, this is what blows my mind. What did the master, when the servants came in and said, look, master, look what I did, what did he say to them about what they did? You have been faithful with a few things. <laughs> like, I said, 1.4 million, 20 years worth of wages? <laughs> This is, this is what your Savior has given you. Like, your Savior Jesus, what I'm trying to say is your Savior Jesus is so absolutely, abundantly generous to you. Even the one who only got one, which you're like, oh, it's just one. It's $1.4 million, maybe. This is what your Savior Jesus has given to you. And, and, and now take this. Now, how did, when these two servants, the first two, came before their master and said, look, master, here's what I've got, what did they not mention? sin I think in the back of our minds when we think about meeting Jesus and standing before his judgment's throne 
We, we imagine saying, Jesus, I did the best I could. I'm sorry about all this other stuff. And, and truthfully, there's a lot of things for which we must repent and be sorry about. But these servants, when they come before the master that day, they don't say, oh, gee, master, here, here's my ten talents, but I'm sorry about all the screw-ups along the way. See, so thoroughly have, do they know that their sins have been forgiven. So completely has the blood of Jesus covered them that when they come before him on that day, their sin is not even on their mind. So thoroughly has Jesus forgiven your sins. So much has Jesus' blood covered over your every weakness, every sin. So so completely are you covered by his blood so that when you come before him on the last day, when you come before him on any day, you can simply say, Here, Jesus, it's for you. Look what I did, Master. Like, Like that little child coming to their preschool teacher saying, Look, I colored this for you. And maybe it looks like a bunch of scribbles to Jesus, but, but what does Jesus say to the servants? What does the master say? Well done. Jesus has truly given each one of us talents. And you can take that out. You can read into that whatever you want to read. Everything in your life is a talent when you read this parable. It's your money. It's your time. It's your treasure. It's your skills. It's your abilities. It's your callings in life. Right? Jesus has given each one of us callings in life as husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and friends and as neighbors, as aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, all those things. Those are trusts from Jesus, people that Jesus has given you responsibility for. And, and when you come before him on the last day, you do not come like a dog with a tail between its legs, hanging, be, hanging your heads down. Because, yes, as we walk through life, we, met, we sin. And we fail. But those sins have been so thoroughly covered by the blood of Jesus that when you come on the last day and you bring your offerings, the offering of your entire life before your master, he will simply say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come, come, enjoy your master's happiness. God grant that it will be so. For the sake of his son, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now may the God of peace grant you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen.